Thank you. Welcome all. Welcome all to this uh, meeting of the Princeton Bucharest uh, seminar in um, early modern philosophy. Um, and the subject today is Virori Svoboda, the variety of knowledge and the unity of wisdom. And uh, there are going to be four speakers. And the um, the um, questions should be um, 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 are, are, are going to follow um, after all of the speakers have given their presentations. And the first, the first speaker is going to be um, uh, Natalia Filipuit. I'm sorry, from the University of Alberta. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, before I begin, allow me to dedicate this presentation to fellow early modernists who have lost absolutely everything in the Hostomel region and Berdyansk at the beginning of the war and to others whose offices and book collections were destroyed by the shelling in the Kharkiv region. Thankfully, they continue their research in spite of the devastation. Slava Ukraini. There is a change in my proposed topic, although I will be discussing the impact of the Neo-Latin curriculum on the formation of Rehori Skovoroda as a writer. Today, my focus is on his prose rather than his poetry. Therefore, I will not broach the question of the Garden of Divine Songs as a manifesto of a Christian Epicurean and its relation relationship to the gardens of Andrew Marvel. My main thesis is that Skovoroda's compositional strategies bear the clear imprint of copia verborum and imitatio, the very exercises humanist scholars design to enrich the vocabulary of their charges and to elicit from them varied forms of expression. His prose is permeated with adages, emblems, symbols, hieroglyphics, parables, and fables, the very strategies that instructors of the trivium employ to direct their pupils towards civil and sacred eloquence in Latin. Moreover, his mindset is informed by the theory of Pietas Literata. In other words, he gives preference to a small set of antique authors who serve as models of good speech and ethical behavior. He affirms poetry only insofar as it serves moral goals. For him, the Bible remains the paramount classical text. Lastly, he does not depart from the triune goal with which the humanist precept preceptors inculcated their neopoetas, instructing delighting and persuading. In one respect, however, his understanding of, the liter of literature represents a rebellion against the neo-Latin poetics of the humanistic educational establishment, which sanctioned the idealization of actual, that is historical individuals, according to the probabilities of moral philosophy, that is what ought to have happened. In this manner, the theory complemented the pedagogic objective of shaping character through the stimuli of praise and blame. The theory did not promote poetic fiction per se, but it did grant poets the right to exercise invention when embellishing true episodes and creating new ones. Over the fabular or fictional, the theory elevated very similitude of invention that is the strategy of, strategy of persuading an audience through the portrayal of believable events. In conjunction with this, the theory emphasized human actions or deeds, acciones humanas or gesta, as the, as the preeminent subject matter of poetry. Skovoroda vehemently rejected this aspect of school poetics. Consequently, in his collection, the Orchard of Divine Songs, there are only three poems dedicated to distinguished individuals with whom he was personally acquainted. 
they are praised only for being an imitation of Christ. Their deeds are not enumerated and therefore not idealized according to the principles of verisimilitude. In short, Skovoroda, unlike many of his uh, predecessors at the Kiev Mohila Collegium, did not leave us a collection of panegyrical poetry. He did write a poem that mentions Bogdan Khmelnytsky, a historical figure, but he did not include it in the orchard, in the orchard titled De Libertate. It rather praises the value of liberty and expresses Kovoroda's own fear of losing his personal freedom. The 17th century Hetman is mentioned as a hero, but only because he defended liberty. To construct his brief praise, Skovoroda begins by posing a question anthologized in school exercise books. What is more precious than gold? A similar utilization of the question we encounter in a 1622 poem by Kasyan Sakovich, in honor of the recently deceased Hetman Petro Konashevich Sahaidachny, who was wounded at the Battle of Khotein. Here, the praise of golden liberty also reflects the ideology and political aspirations of the Cossacks as a corporate entity. Skovoroda condemned the creation of images, patterns, examples, or exemplary mirrors of virtue portraying idealized individuals. Consequently, when he cited the traditional exculpation of poets from the charge that they are liars, he did not point at verisimilitude of invention, but they held a unique type of imitation. And we'll see this later. An essentially humanist understanding of the origin and function of language led him to conjoin into one indivisible whole the theory, the theory of art with anti-scholastic theology. Let us note that scholastic texts were used in the quadrivium of all Neo-Latin schools, including the Kiev Mohila Academy. Skovoroda's approach was most probably informed by the evangelical humanism of Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam, an author he liked and praised and praised. Erasmus had significantly influenced the pedagogical procedures of the early modern trivium and attempted to recast, recast theology from its traditional philosophical mode into a grammatical one. Skovoroda never completed his theology course and refused to take monastic orders. Thus he forfeited the right to become a full-time teacher. As a matter of fact, he frequently ran afoul of the educational establishment, which intermittently hired him at various levels of the trivium. He never taught at the quadrivial level. A talented poet, he did not write much poetry. Two thirds of his divine songs were written in the period when he held regular teaching assignments. That's between 1750 and 1764. After being expelled from the Kharkiv Collegium in 1769, Skovoroda became an itinerant philosopher and concentrated on prose. Most of his writings, fables, tracts, and colloquies were composed during the last 25 years of his life. In his prose, Skovoroda, in true humanistic fashion, upholds the preeminence of philological and moral training. The practical sciences play merely a secondary role in his curriculum. For example, in The Circle, A Friendly Conversation on the Spiritual World, which was written in the 1770s, Skovoroda complains that students leave school equipped with arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and geography, but are ignorant of Plato, Socrates, Solon, Pythagoras, and Cicero. He's especially vexed that the antique authors, above all Moses and the prophets, are neglected, misunderstood, and treated as superstitious charlatans. Skovoroda's prose always implies an audience. In his dedicatory statements, he discusses a variety of questions from genre to etymology. He coaxes and exhorts, even anticipates that his offerings will bring delight or dispel 
his recipient's despondency. The letter accompanying the circle, for, ex uh, for example, expresses the hope that this colloquy will lead Vladimir Tevyashov to read the Bible with pleasure and, perspic uh, and perspicacity. His humanistic, humanistic ideals and pedagogical inclination are fused into one in the dedication accompanying a small book called The Silenos of Alkibiades, 1776, addressed to Vladimir's father, Colonel Stepan Tevyashov. Tevyashov, this letter encourages the elder Tevyashov to imitate Cicero's Cato and find time for banquets devoted to pleasant and spiritually fulfilling colloquy. Skovoroda does not hesitate to remind the colonel that it behooves men of status to orient themselves toward God and to combat superstition. Skovoroda's dedicatory letters and the characters participating on his colloquy suggest that his immediate audience consisted of a small circle of friends and patrons who were neither philosophers nor theologians. He upholds the authority of the three sacral languages recognized by the Ukrainian educational system since its inception. However, working on the premise that theology is for everyone, Skovoroda, unlike the Latin-oriented theologians of the Kiev Academy, not only opts for, uh, not only opt for, opts for Slavonic, but tailors it significantly to suit his informal conversations with local friends. Here we see how the rhetorical situation generates the language of a text. Both participants and recipients are laymen of different age groups and professional backgrounds. The pedagogical and colloquial nature of the enterprise reinforces this choice of the stylistic mean. In consideration of the area where he lives, and, and at this time it is the, the, the Kharkiv area, and then uh, the steps around, um, and his ethnically heterogeneous audience, Skovoroda spices, uh, spices his Slavonic medium with numerous Ukrainianisms and Russianisms. For his fables, he makes the same linguistic and stylistic choice, but allows an even greater number of Ukrainianisms. This was done not necessarily to observe elementary pedagogical practice, namely to write fables in the vernacular, for, pip, for pupils uninitiated, uninitiated into Latin, but because his fables had a Ukrainian addressee, the lawyer Panas Pankiv. Skovorda's prose often reveals, albeit in rather unexpected context, his attitude toward the theory of art. One key text in this respect is the primary door to Christian ethics. A brief work which outlines to a greater or lesser degree the thematic content of Skovoda's lectures on ethics, which he read in 1768-1769 and edited in 1780. The primary door begins by procla proclaiming in Epicurean fashion that all which is necessary in life can be easily accomplished. And the first rather brief composition on God Skovoroda declares that the world consists of two natures, one visible, the other invisible. He identifies the letter with God, whom he designates as the universal mind. The second text, titled On the Ecumenical Fate, consists of three short paragraphs, and here Skovoroda states that all the ages and nations have unanimously believed in a mysteriously and omnipotent power which permeates to all things. He concludes with the sentence, such faith is universal and simple. The third section titled on the universal enterprise proclaims that divine nature, that is invisible nature, infuses life into all matter and manages the cycle of life and death. This continuous Kovoroda is called the universal enterprise because it concerns the well-being of all creatures. In a lengthy section titled On the Particular Enterprise of Men, Skovoroda designates God as the purest and universal mind of all nations, which acts as the source of the arts and wisdom necessary for the exercise of life. The greatest debt of every nation is that his mind 
infuse humanity with the supreme with its supreme wisdom its own portrait and seal divine wisdom explains kovarda surprises surpasses all other intelligent spirits and concepts just like a master successor naslipnik is the word he uses is better than his servant sujeti it is important to note that according to the lexico- lexicographers Epifani Slavenetsky and Arseniy Koretsky Satanovsky, Naslidnik, besides meaning success- successor, can signify one who inherits, one who follows in the footsteps of a predecessor, an imitator or emulator, where slujetil can also mean minister, be it a political one or a religious one. Skovoruda then states that divine wisdom literally resembles an architectural plan, which unfolds imperceptibly through a structure, throughout the structure, and thus sustains and stabilizes it, exploiting the polysemous nature of corpus, which means both building and body. He claims that God's wisdom strengthens and imparts peace and good fortune upon the political edifice by secretly following through its human limbs. Both symbolical matrices, the anatomic and the architectural, fuse once once again in a discussion on society. Skovoroda argues that whenever a family, city, or state is erected in accordance with the divine model, the temple of God abides within it. And just as the mind governs the different movements of a body's limbs, Divine wisdom acts through the various constituent members for the common good of the society it binds. Diagrammatically, divine wisdom is both the geometric center of the political edifice and organic head of society's body. Skovoroda argues that one enterprise unique to humankind depends on God's wisdom. For as his most beautiful countenance imprints itself upon human souls, it transforms imageless monsters into human beings. That is, animals that are kind, tolerant, generous, just, and worthy of friendship and membership in various social units. By playfully contrasting the noun litso, countenance, visage, face, face, person, with the polysemous adjective vezobrazny, impolite, imageless, faceless, shapeless, a negative example, he multiplies the levels of meaning and metaphoric correspondences. However, of great, greater interest to us is the fact that Skovoruda's system, the, metaphor, the metamorphic power of divine wisdom, lays the foundation for social concord. Skovoroda introduces yet another architectural metaphor when he mentions that the divine countenance, once it is inscribed upon human hearts, turns men into buildings, into building blocks of the living temple. Therein, he explains, God rules with special love. The pivotal passage in this uh, discourse declares that recently God's wisdom revealed itself in the image figure, form, example of man, thus becoming God-human. Bohočelovik is the, the word in Slavonic. At this point, Skovoroda introduces the principal tenet of his theology, which rejects the validity of logical inquiry into the mystery of wisdom's birth and resurrection. He exhorts the reader not to indulge in, curio- in curiosity, Lubopitstvo, but rather to behave as if he were at the opera. Instead of scrutinizing what tr- transpires behind the scenes, Skovoroda recommends that satisfaction is to be derived from the performance taking place on stage. Undue intimacy with great persona and their, and their deeds generates discourtesy toward them. Base curiosity, he continues, in, in Erasmian fashion, has led to the schisms, superstitions, and other ulcers currently afflicting Europe. Skovoroda then claims that for God, it is more important to animate, stir one aimless soul with the spirit of his commandments, that to bring forth a new earthly sphere 
populated with lawless men. Bezakonniki. Let me quickly note that he is playing on the double meaning of zakonnik, which can be a priest. The zakonnik is someone who breaks the law, and the relationship elicits, uh, should elicit a, a nice smile from the knowing reader. By, by comparing the question, this question of scholastic theology with improper behavior at the opera and a servant's unfaithfulness, Skovoroda suggests that this type of theology does not serve the divine imitator, but rather transgresses against social and professional decorum. Worthy of note in this context is the fact that 17th and 18th century religious polemics would invariably address the question theologica, be it from the Orthodox side or the Catholic side. However, there are texts composed at the Cave Mohila Academy which avoid it altogether. Uh, one prom prominent example is the debate between the future Martha Catherine and the pagan philosophers in a play composed during Mazeppa's time. In that debate, she does not address the question theologica in any way. From this point, Onward, what Skovoroda has depicted strictly in visual terms, portrait, seal, countenance, will also be presented as a speaking entity. Skovoroda first announces that God's eternal wisdom, without ever growing silent, continues to utter its speech, reach, among all nations and through all ages. He then refers to divine wisdom as both an invisible countenance and a living oration, Zhevoye Slova, secretly thundering within us. From the arguments posited thus far, it is clear that eternal wisdom, the axis of Skovoroda's symbolical matrix, cannot be discerned with corpore corporeal eyes, but does express and has been expressing itself through speech from the very beginning. Skovoroda subsequently emphasizes that his contemporaries are not receptive, receptive to the counsels of divine wisdom, and this he explains is partly due to deafness, but mostly to, due to the obstinacy, obstinacy which meager education generates. After a section on the Decalogue, Skovoroda briefly discusses faith as an anchor, the differences between piety and ceremony, the differences between ritual and divine law, the base passions as manifestations of sin, and love as purity of heart. The primary door, especially the section I have just summarized, is an elegant and well-crafted composition. By occasionally violating natural grammatical order, Skovoroda forces the reader to retrace his steps and discern the relationship between modifiers and objects modified in the given syntactical unit. Also, by initiating consecutive sentences with the same pronomial subject, Skovoroda invites the reader to return once again and verify the referent in question. Throughout Skovoroda harnesses polysemy and synonymy for a very special, though at first imperceptible purpose. He does not convey the relationship between God the Father and God the Son through the uniformity, uniformity of a logical proposition. Instead, he intimates the theological tenet by means of a synonymous bond that is the relationship between the mind and the wisdom it generates. The filiation of the letter is communicated by the noun's natural portrait, seal, successor. Only later when Skovoroda speaks about God-man does he mention the birth, resurrection, and ascension of wisdom. Skovoroda employs these techniques in all of his tracts and colloquies. 
Of extreme importance in Skovoroda system is the fact that divine wisdom reveals itself through speech, not only after, but also before it assumes human countenance. Consequently, the invisible speaker, orator, that is he who delivers the reach or the slova, oratio in Erasmus's explication, as the axis and the head of Skovoroda's allegorical construct is none other than God the Son, Christ. If we bear in mind the classical thesis that the orator was the savior of citizens, we realize that Skovoroda adheres to the humanist teleological perspective on speech introduced into Ukraine at the end of the 16th century. But when we review the passage where he describes divine wisdom transforming imageless brutes into kind and tolerant animals who are worthy of friendship and life in society, we also realize that Skovoroda sacralizes Cicero's idea of rhetoric as the agent of civilization. The sacralized teleology of, elo of eloquence is in fact the spiritus movens of Skovoroda's prose oeuvre from the fable to the tract and the colloquy. Thank you. Then your microphone is off. Excuse me. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Uh, the next speaker will be Maria Gracia uh, Bartolini. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here and for giving some visibility to Ukrainian early modern culture. Um, I'm going to um, share my screen just a second. Okay, um, so um, my presentation today uh, is gonna echo some of the things that Natalia just mentioned. And um, it deals with what may look like a mere philological curiosity in one of Skovoroda's text, but that a curiosity that actually helps us understand uh, is a philosophical modus operandi and the multifarious nature of his sources and his readings. Um, so in one rather obscure passage of the dialogue called uh, The Ring, a friendly conversation on the spiritual world um, composed between 17, 1773 and 1774, uh, we encounter the attribution of a verse uh, quoted in Greek in the text uh, to the most ancient Zoroaster. Um, Skovoroda calls him uh, Tridrievni um, Zoroaster. Um, I was unsure about the composition of our audience uh, in linguistic terms, and so I translated um, Skovoroda's uh, passages into English, just to be sure that everybody could follow without problems, and I will occasionally refer uh, to the words in, in old Ukrainian or Czechoslovakic um, when it's like um, useful to do so. Um, so one of the characters, Yaakov, says, uh, but the ancient Zoroaster um, came to my mind uh, with this song, Klusi makar panderkes ekon ayonon omma. That is, uh, listen, uh, bless one with an eternal all seeing eye. And uh, another character in the dialogue replies, uh, many people say is singing this um, to the sun. Um, so this Greek verse, which one of the five participants in the dialogue describes as belonging to a solar hymn, um, is followed at a short distance in this dialogue by a quotation from Malachi 4.2, uh, the famous uh, like passage about the son of justice, which is a traditional Christological attribute. 
and by another enigmatic sentence uh, whose authorship is attributed to ancient wise men, Starina Yaluba Mudri, uh, concerning the center and circumference of God. Um, remember the ancient wise men saying, the center of God is everywhere, the circumference uh, nowhere. Um, so what we witness here is the first of only two instances in which the ancient Persian prophet Zoroaster is mentioned in Skoboroda's works. Um, the same fragment that we saw uh, before, uh, listen, blast one with an old seeing eye, um, appears also in the fourth section of the treatise uh, Silenus Alcibiades, uh, which was composed in 1775, between 1775 and 1776. Um, and there, this verse, which for the moment I will call, I will define pseudo Zoroastrian, um, is embedded in a textual environment, which is quite similar uh, to that of the Kautso. Uh, in fact, there the sign is listed among the circular objects that the wise men of different ages considered as an archetypal god. And there is Kuburuda writes, uh, this only principle, uh, Nachalo in the original, as the head of wisdom is being portrayed by people in different cultures and nations by different figures and monuments. For example, a ring, a sphere, the sun, an eye, all objects with a circular shape. Um, Zoroaster depicted the sun with this song here, a blessed one with an eternal all-seeing eye. So we find again uh, the same verse, uh, this time um, translated into uh, old Ukrainian old U Ukrainian mixed with Church Slavonic. Uh, it's not quoted in Greek in the text uh, this time. Um, um, so um, after uh, Quoting a Zoroaster, he refers to the spread of solar cults among the Persians and to the use of the term Sunday to designate the day of the Lord. Uh, here we are. Uh, hence, ancient Persians adore the sun and call Sunday um, the day uh, of the Lord. And after establishing a connection between Zoroaster and the Persian solar cults, uh, in the Selenus Alcibiades, Skoroda goes on to refer to the mystagogues who in different times and places were engaged in the study of the invisible principle, Nachalo, underlying visible reality. Um, and this syncretic chain starts with the Hebrew prophets and includes the Magi uh, and the Chaldeans. Um, and this suggests that Skuruda is willing to include Zoroaster among the wise men who took part, albeit from a pagan perspective, uh, in the search for God. Um, so the divine mystagogues attribute the principle solely to God. He who has seen this principle through the darkness was called a prophet by the Hebrews. Um, in some places, they called them Magi. In some other places, Chaldeans, Gymnosophists. The Greeks called them Magi, Sophi, philosophers, Gymnosophists, etc. And we are going to go back to some of these terms um, in a while. So interestingly, um, Skoboroda's list of wise men uh, includes all the main representatives of the so-called Prisca Theologia, or ancient theology, which was popularized during the Renaissance by the writings of Marsilio Ficino and the Byzantine scholar Gemistus Plethin. Um, the Prisca Theologia is the doctrine that asserts that the philosophy of the ancients, uh, Plato, Orpheus, Zoroaster, represents different temporal manifestations of the perennial truth, which achieved its final synthesis in Christian religion. Uh, the two humanist philosophers, in turn, elaborated the theme already present in the writings of Clement of Alexandria, who, drawing on Proclus' notion of a pre-Platonic philosophy, uh, thought that divine wisdom originated in the East from the Chaldeans, uh, the Magi, the Egyptians, and the Greeks, uh, the philosophers, and then passed to the Hebrews, uh, the prophets, uh, through Moses, uh, who many considered a contemporary of Orpheus. Underlying this conception is the belief in the unity of being and truth, one in which the different nominal, temporal, and geographical transmutations of wisdom do not alter its eternal face. 
um, according to Pleasan, um, Zoroaster is the oldest of the of these ancient theologians. And here uh, we should remember uh, that uh, Skovoroda calls Zoroaster the most ancient, the Pridriavne. And so here we have uh, um, a um, parallelism uh, between what uh, Pleasan is saying and what Skovoroda is saying. Um, in the Platonic theology, uh, Marsilio Ficino lists this genealogy uh, of ancient uh, philosophers. Um, first Zoroaster, then Mercury Trismegistus, then Orpheus, then Aglaephemus, then Pythagoras, and finally um, Plato. Um, so uh, this uh, Prisca uh, theologia, this ancient theology in the form uh, we have outlined here, um, survived throughout the 16th century. And in 1585, the Italian philosopher and occultist uh, Giordano Bruno proposed a genealogy that is similar to the one that we've just seen in Skovoroda, uh, even in the use uh, of the term Sofi. Uh, so for um, Giordano Bruno, uh, this wise man, uh, we're uh, called uh, Gymnosophista uh, by the Indians, uh, Kabbalist uh, by the Hebrews, Magi by the Persians, Sofi uh, by the Greeks, Sofi up Grecos, and uh, Sapientes. Uh, by uh, the, the Romans. Uh, and here uh, we can see that some of the terms used by uh, Giordano Bruno to define these ancient theologians, this precursor of uh, Christian uh, religion, um, literally coincide with the terms used uh, by Skoroda in the fragment, in the passage uh, we have just um, analyzed. Um, so the inclusion of the most ancient Zoroaster, the Pridrielni Zoroaster, among the representatives of the Prisca Theologia uh, marks uh, the recovery of a set of ideas that was characteristic of Renaissance syncretism and that mirrors Kovaruda's own attitude towards the possibility to conciliate pagan culture with Christian truth. Um, significantly, uh, the sentence, uh, God's center is everywhere and the circumference nowhere, uh, which in the dial culto appears uh, just after this Greek verse attributed to Zoroaster, uh, was also used by Marsilio Ficino in the Platonic theology, where uh, we have Deus as circle spiritualis, God as a spiritual circle, uh, cuius centrum est ubique, circumferentia nusquam, whose center is everywhere uh, and the circumference uh, nowhere. Um, so if this aspect uh, is more or less clear, um, the question of the sources, of the textual sources from which Skuvaruda may have drawn uh, what I call the pseudo-Zoroastrian verse uh, is, however, more difficult to solve. Uh, let us start uh, for a moment with a brief overview of the writings traditionally attributed to Zoroaster, uh, which were which are known under uh, the name of Oracula Caldaica, Caldaic oracles. Um, the Caldaic oracles originated in the Middle Platonic environment uh, at the end of the second century AD, uh, and they were collected and commented for the first time in the 11th century by the Byzantine monk and Neoplatonist philosopher Michael Psellus. Uh, before Psellus, quotations from the oracles were widely disseminated among the Neoplatonists, Proclus and Porphyry, and in the writings of church historian and polemicist Eusebius of Caesarea. Um, the second commentator of the oracles was Gemistus Plethon, uh, who produced a compilation that was very similar, but not identical to that of Psellus. Uh, Plethon's collection was published for the first time in Paris in 1538 by Ioannis um, Lodoikus uh, Tilatanos under the title Magica Zoroastri uh, Oracula. Um, a Tilatanus version uh, had nine reprints between 1539 and 1722. Um, in his Nova, uh, the Universis Philosophia, uh, the neo, uh, the Platonic philosopher Francesco Patrizzi um, increased uh, to 324 the number of oracles attributed to Zoroaster. Uh, now, what is interesting here is that 
none of these collections feature the verse that Skoboroda attributes to Zoroaster. Um, so where does this verse come from? Um, it actually belongs to the eight um, of the Orphic hymns uh, in which we actually have Klusi Makar Panderkes Eklun Ionion of Mahir blessed with an eternal all seen eye. Um, the Orphic hymns uh, are a set of 87 poems, uh, possibly composed at some point in the second or third century. Uh, and uh, this hymn number eight uh, is indeed dedicated to the sun here. We see the dedication, Helio, Sunyama, Alibano, Mannan. Uh, and here we might recall uh, that in the dialogue also, Afanasi was saying, uh, many people say is singing it uh, to the sun. Um, this raises a further interpretative problem uh, because we have an apparent contradiction between the Iranian attribution of the verse and Skoboroda's accurate knowledge of its context. Um, and unlike other cases, uh, Skoboroda's quotation is also extremely faithful to the original text, uh, which would suggest that the philosopher had direct access um, to the original while he was writing uh, both Calzo and Silenus Alcibiades. Um, what I want to argue here is that Skuvruda uh, possibly had access to a philosophical esoteric miscellany uh, that contained both uh, the oracles and the Orphic hymns, and that the thematic and spatial proximity of the two groups of compositions might have contributed to the erroneous attribution. Uh, a brief history of the uh, Orphic hymns and that their circulation in early modern Europe um, will help reinforce uh, my argument. Um, the first edition of Orpheus Ends um, appeared um, in Florence on September 19, 1500. And before this date, uh, no source contains any information about the hymns. Uh, the oldest manuscript uh, now lost was brought uh, from Constantinople in 1424 by Giovanni Aurispa. So the year 1500 represents the terminus postquem uh, of the hypothetical source of Skovrodas quotation. Um, of the extant manuscripts, um, uh, the, the Codex uh, Thrilitianus, um, uh, the Codex Marcianus, the Codex Parisinus, the Codex Laurentianus, and uh, the Codex Vaticanus uh, Ottobunianus uh, um, also uh, include uh, along the Orphic hymns a uh, Plisos version of the Magica Dicta ex Zoroastre. Uh, and the same compositional criteria, uh, which mirror the Renaissance cult of Prisca Theologia, as well as the widespread early modern interest in magic and esotericism also seem to permeate some of the collections that appeared in print during the 16th century. Uh, for instance, in 1566, Henri Estian uh, published uh, Poeta Greci Principes Eroici Carminis, and in 1573, uh, Poesis Philosophica. Uh, and these are two collections of poetic and philosophical fragments that included both the Orphic hymns and uh, the oracles by Zoroaster. And uh, as we uh, learn uh, from a letter written by Francesco Patrizzi and dated May 27, uh, 1571, uh, Francesco Patrizzi himself had collected a Sapiense Cesaurus, a Cesaurus of Wisdom, which included the oracles of Zoroaster, the Hermetic writings, uh, many Orphic and Pythagorean fragments, as well as the writings of the pre-Socratics. Um, moreover, throughout the Renaissance, the Orphic hymns were associated with solar magic. And we have seen that Skoboroda links, explicitly links uh, Zoroaster and this specific verse uh, to the ancient solar cults. Hence, the ancient Persians adore the sun and call Sunday uh, the day uh, of the Lord. Um, this information is essentially correct, and the role of the Magus Zoroaster, Zoroaster, Zoroaster so Magus, as the founder of the religion that had its main god in the son Mithras, 
is related by Plutarch in a text that must have been known to Skovoroda, uh, the, um, the Isis at Osiris. Uh, in the Contra Calcium, Origen writes of certain Persian mysteries, Persica Mysteria, and identifies them with the mysteries of Mithras. While in the Apologeticum, Tertullian contrasts the Persian solar cults to the Christian habit of rejoicing on the day of the sign of the Solis. So in conclusion, it's reasonable to assume that two complementary factors may have led Skubaruda to attribute the authorship of the Orphic hymn to Zoroaster. Um, first, uh, the coexistence of the Orphic hymns and the oracles within the same collection. Um, second, uh, the presence of strong thematic similarities between the solar nature of Zoroastrianism uh, in the form attested by Plutarch and the early church fathers and the content of the Orphic hymn. Um, interestingly, this is not the only instance of an erroneous attribution based on what we might call a thematic proximity. Um, Skovoroda has many of this uh, misattribution and mismatches. mismatches. Um, for instance, in the 29th poem uh, of his uh, Orchard of Divine Songs, um, he quotes the verse, tolle voluntatem propriam et tolletur infernus, so take away one's own will, and you will take away, you will eliminate hell. And he attributes this verse to Saint Augustine. Although this sentence does not appear in any of Augustine's work, and looks and it looks much closer to a passage from Saint Bernard, um, uh, this third sermon in Tempore Pascali, Cesset voluntas propria et infernus non erit. So if uh, one's own will would cease, we wouldn't have hell. Uh, however, uh, the first sentence written by Skubruda uh, recalls Augustine's doctrine of sin and free will, as it is outlined in uh, the treatise Contra Fortunatum, uh, where Augustine writes, Nisi libera voluntas esset in nobis peccata non esset. So if we didn't have, if we wouldn't have um, the free will, there wouldn't be uh, no sin. Um, so in this respect, we may go as far as saying that there is a peculiar uh, Skovorodian logic underlying its textual uh, mistakes. Um, so while uh, this uh, may seem a minor philological curiosity, uh, what we've seen at play here is one of the central tenets uh, of Skovoroda's philosophy. Uh, namely, that there is a unity to the world that transcends the apparent diversity of phenomenal things. And the metaphysical unity of the world has its counterpart in the historical development of philosophy. And the philosophy of the ancients, Plato, Orpheus, Zoroaster, represents different temporal manifestations of the perennial truths, uh, which achieved its final synthesis in Christian religion. And for Skovoroda, Zoroaster's son and the son of justice of Maleki um, for two are indeed one uh, and the same. Uh, thank you uh, for your attention. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, 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 the, next, the next speaker is Victor Chernyshov. Uh, do, do you have a PowerPoint as well? Yes, yes, I'm here. Excellent. Yeah, well. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for having me here. And um, um, I may say that as, uh, as the previous speakers uh, went, so to say, deep into Skovarada, so my presentation is uh, is rather um, an overview of Skovarada's doctrine. So it is titled Gregory Skovarada between poetry, philosophy, and theology. Uh, it is in four section and it is preceded by a very brief introduction and ends with um, a very brief conclusion. Actually, well. Uh, Gregory Skorodam is an outstanding figure in Ukrainian culture. 
uh, his position in Ukrainian culture is similar to this of Ivan Kotlarevsky, who is credited to be the, uh, the founder of um, uh, contemporary, uh, contemporary Ukrainian language, and Taras Shevchenko, um, who is credited to be the greatest, and actually he is uh, the greatest poet um, in, in Ukraine. So Gregory Skovroda is a figure that creates and fashions Ukrainian culture, the figure uh, with whom go by and synchronize their watches, all those who like as a heart desires the fountains of water, seek not only after the earthly, but also for the divine, uh, divine wisdoms. Something is my presentation. Um, as the purpose of this brief presentation is to clarify uh, the connection between the three major aspects of Gregory Skorada works, poetical, philosophical, and theological. Um, by the way, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to this slide. Uh, here you, you can see the picture of, uh, as it is said, the authentic watch uh, uh, carried by Skovorodam. Um, according to his historical posture, uh, Gregory Skovorodam belongs to the period of Baroque. It is a very specific time. Uh, it was the time when people with an special acuteness experienced the brevity of human life and its transitoriness, human mortality and vulnerability, when human being is perceived as a, as a butterfly that flies to the flame of a burning candle, and human passions and troubles are experienced in an especially subtle and sensitive way. Our contemporary culture perception of the world is determined primarily with completely different times and historical periods, the periods of enlightenment and romanticism. And therefore, sometimes it is so difficult to understand what Skavada is talking about to get to his point. So Baroque period is a period when humanity endeavors to know itself from the point of aesthetics. As now we can get to know St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, Baroque poetry. Did we? Oh, I think it's frozen. It's frozen. Anything? We can, can hear you hear me? We no, can hear we can hear you. Well, that's okay. Well, um, perhaps something with my connection be because I'm in Ukraine, so uh, sometimes uh, the light is going on and sometimes it's switched off. So no, please bear with me. <clears throat> So, alia res septrum, alia plectrum. One thing is Bishop's Kreuzer, and another completely different one is a flute of a shepherd. Skorada said to a bishop who did not know the limits of his competence and believed to be the expert in nearly everything, including the field of poetics. This bishop, Nicodemus Srebnitsky, was his name, however, dismissed Skorada from Priyaslav college eventually. God and the world, the Bible and human being, the eternal and transitory or ephemeral, all these were experienced in contrast of the highest degree. That is now, that is how the period of Baroque experience being and um, experience being and reality in the same way Grigory Skovrada did within the context of his time. Our life is a travel, a pilgrimage, says Skovrada, in full correspondence with his time and the Baroque cultural tradition. Is he a poet? Certainly. Gregory Skovrada is a poet, 
He began as a poet and all his work uh, is a work of a poet. He is a poet to the backbone and to the marrow of his bones. His first works, as well as the rest, are poesies. His Harko fables and his dialogues are the poetry in prose. Stephen Tamara, whose son's home teacher was Korada, once said, My friend, God blessed thee with a gift of spirit and word. Poetry is not merely a particular art that consists in writing verses, but a process both more general and more primary. As Jack Meritan once observed, poetry like metaphysics is spiritual nourishment. Being a spiritual energy, poetry therefore has its source uh, in the preconceptual life of the intellect. The intellect is no less a degree participates in the creative process than imagination. As well as the imagination, the intellect is at the core of poetry. Um, and here uh, on the you know, on the right of this slide, you can see the um, uh, you can see the first poem by Skovaradam as Kovalinsky. Um, Kowalinski reports is, uh, it uh, leaves in a spirit of mine. I've got to move score if she's in the name is star. Um, in Skovaradam's language in Ukrainian or ancient Ukrainian as it is put put now. Uh, uh, which uh, so impressed Stephen Tamara. <clears throat> Yet what does Kovarda's spirit nourish with? What is his poetry filled with? What is its major topic? The garden of the divine songs that has grown from the grains of the Holy Scripture. Such a title bears the only collection of Gregory Skovarada's poems, which had been collected and edited by the author. The content of Gregory Skovarada's works um, is a philosophic and theological content clad into poetical garments. Skovarada's definition of philosophy, uh, Skovarada def defined philosophy in a particular way. So, uh, philosophy or the love of wisdom directs all the circle of its deeds to the, that end, that to give life to our spirit, gentleness to our heart, brightness to our thoughts, as to the heart of everything. When the spirit um, in a person is joyful, thirds are quiet the heart is in peace everything else is bright happy blessed that is philosophy uh, the major philosophical problems which skovarada states and endeavors to solve uh, in his works are uh, the problem of overcoming the fear of death, the problem of human happiness and the peace of heart, the correspondence between social and personal in human life. The rest of philosophical problems and approaches, even those which can be found in textbooks, such as the problem of thoroughness, connaturality, or vocation, metaphysics, and the theory of knowledge, and primarily the cell knowledge, uh, a question of correlation between the human nature and person and human being, the theory of friendship designed by Skovarada, purpose providing answers for these fundamental queries of the human spirit. Gregory Skovarada is a religious thinker par excellence. He moves from the particular in particulars of human life and religious content of his consciousness to the realities of divine life. This anabasis 
ascent or climbing up uh, is the fundamental feature of his work. Skavrada, however, is interested in the divine world so far as it concerns the human destiny and human way, which leads through the valley of uh, earthly life upon the mountains of wisdom and justice. Um, and here uh, we can see uh, how uh, Gregory Skovarada defines um, uh, the philosopher. So uh, here is the Gregory Skovarada definition of philosopher. Uh, so what is to be philosopher? To be philosopher is this means to be a prophet or philosopher, to see beyond the empty desert, beyond material elements, something new, every young, wondrous, and eternal, and announce that. And, uh, and then uh, here as goes uh, such a brief instruction how, how a philosopher must uh, behave himself. Do not be blatant and unadvised. Go quietly. Life is a dangerous way. Get accustomed to satisfy yourself with little. Do not imitate people who spread their heart over appearances. Learn to gather uh, your scattered thoughts, turning them into yourself. Your happiness in, is inside of you. Here is buried its center. Getting known yourself, you will know everything. walk in the dark and tremble for fear where there was no fear. Uh, to know yourself fully, get acquainted and befriended with yourself. This is unalienated peace, true happiness and perfect, perfect wisdom. In one of his letters, uh, it is quite early, Skovaradam. He's just uh, 38 years old to Kirill or Theodor Lechevetsky, dated back to 1761. Gregory Skovaradam expresses his credo in the following way. What would you expect from a person who eternally dedicated uh, all of himself to the muses? if not the fact that it exclusively concerns uh, the perfecting of the soul. You say that I promise grand things. That is the way it is, my friend. If you ponder my soul and wishes, other the wished uh, for uh, does not always come true. Regarding me, let others care about gold, about honors, about certain appals, banquets, about base pleasures. Uh, let them seek out the support of the people, glory, the favors of nobles. Let them receive what they think are treasures. I do not envy them, for I have spiritual riches and that spiritual bread and that clothing without which you cannot enter into the adorned places of the heavenly groom. I direct all my strength, all my will to this. May everything corporeal disappear. But you want me to more clearly show my soul. I ask, I abandon and have abandoned everything so that over the course Uh, of my entire life, I would attain just one thing, to understand what the death of Christ means and what his resurrection means. For no one can be resurrected with Christ if at first you do not die uh, with him. Uh, so uh, here we've got uh, a bridge to uh, Skovarada's theology, and Skovarada's theology is perhaps the most important part of his teaching, and that which is um, least understood by today's people, 
there is a cultural rupture that is too significant and the biblical poetical form of Skavrada's theology doesn't make the things clearer and more comprehensive for the today's reader. In Skavrada's philosophical teaching, the major role belongs to the big human questions. Um, then in theological perspective, Skavrada remains faithful to the traditions of Orthodox Christianity. Uh, which he regards as an essential condition for autopraxy, the right way of acting. The sources of Skavrada's theology are various and manifold, and the previous speakers um, clarified the matter uh, a lot, actually. Uh, so they are various and manifold. He quotes uh, the often without reference, not only from the Bible, but also many of the uh, church fathers and Christian writers, both Eastern and Western, Jewish, Hellenistic writer, Philo of Alexandria, many other authors um, of previous times, and other sources which he considers useful uh, for the occasion. Theology uh, the Catholic or universal science has, according to Skavarada, an advantage and must be preferred uh, to the rest of arts and sciences, since it is the highest science. At the same time, it is both theoretical and practical science. The theoretical character of, of the science is conditioned by its universality and direction on contemplation of God's truths revealed in Jesus Christ as the sublime beauty and highest purpose of human life. Practical character of theology comes from its highest necessity, since the science uh, on God is essential for human beings. So Skovereda believes that human happiness is hardly possible without it. Uh, in his theology, Skavrada reveals himself as a universal theologian and religion, uh, religious teacher. The main theological topics of his are the following ones. First of all, uh, the postulating the idea of God as the creator and preserver of the world and human beings. Skavrada uh, also postulates the idea of the divine providence that sustains not only the world and humankind as a whole, but also every human being in particular. Overcoming of materialism, atheism, and religious superstitions and prejudices. Postulating the universality of human religious craving and need and the ecumenical character of the religious truth. The reality of the spiritual dimension and its primacy over the material one uh, of the world, and essential character and necessity of religion for full and virtuous and therefore truly happy human life. And just to draw a brief conclusion out of all this, uh, I may say that drawing a conclusion, I may say that uh, the temperament and disposition of a poet, the keen and ever questioning wit of a philosopher, as well as a religious intuition and burning face of a theologian combined with hope and love or charity, uh, constitute Gregory Skovrada's wisdom and lay the foundation for the entire building of his work that truth uh, which nourished not only the three of, he, of his work, but also the three of his life. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, and the last speaker is going to be Erica Tamisa Morano. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for welcoming us to this seminar and also Natalia, Maria Grazia and Victor for joining me in this presentation today. 
Um, today, I would like to focus on Grigori Skovoroda's uh, collection of poems, The Garden of Divine Songs, and on how it demonstrates this notion of uh, that an individual's being, knowledge, and ethical and spiritual evolution are one and the same. Uh, in the garden, the speaking eye uh, is the protagonist of the narrated experiences, and so his teachings do not emanate it from a superior source, but from the eyes on life. So the speaker shares with us uh, what he has learned about human nature and about human relationships with God and the universe as he's learning them. In this way, we as readers witness the emergence and development of the speaker's thought, starting from his lived experiences. The Garden of Divine Songs is a collection of 30 songs that uh, were written between the 1750s and 1785 and served as a metric and rhetorical model for the students at the Collegium of Pirislav. Um, it also transcends its didactic goal and appears as a unitary collection built around the lyric persona that maintains a recognizable identity. In an original way, Skovoroda blends Platonism and Neoplatonism, Epicureanism and Stoicism, and blends them with um, its orthodox biblical and patristic traditions and elements of Western thought. Skovoroda, um, as you know, uh, my co-presenters today have shown, um, Skovoroda's education helped him to shape a syncretic system of thought. And this is uh, evident in the uh, Garden of Divine Songs, um, in which apparently antithetical figures like uh, those of Christ and Socrates, Augustine and Epicurus uh, come together. Meanwhile, what guarantees the system's unity is the fact that Skovroda considers every expression of knowledge, both Christian and pagan, as uh, manifestations of divine wisdom and gives prominence to his considering his existence, the embodiment of his thought. Uh, following Ivano's observation that uh, Skovroda's thought is closely tied uh, to the language through which it is expressed, I would like to show how the poetic language of the garden reflects and enhances the subjective attitude towards existence that defines both lyric poetry and Skovroda's philosophy, and how this attitude is based on the idea of self-awareness as the gnosiological, ethical, and ontological cornerstone of human life. The eye in Skovoroda's poems experiences ethical and ontological growth, not through intellectual discourse, but through trials and tribulations. Lyric poetry is the ideal place for the expression of inner experience because, um, as Herb Miner observes, lyric poetry is, quote, literature of radical presence, end quote. Hence, Skovoroda's subject is constantly uh, evolving, uh, crying, rejoicing, and he presents these experiences as if they were happening in, this, in the very moment of writing. By doing so, Skovoroda conveys a sense of co-presence of the speaker and his interlocutors and portrays the suffering subject in a new way. This eye is distinct from the stoic and epicurean imperturbable and changeable subject due to its dynamic nature, which is typical of both Christian and Neoplatonic philosophies. According to Neoplatonism, divine light incarnates the physical world through a, a process of gradual emanation during which its power dims until it fades into dark matter. At this point, the soul starts a path of ascension towards divine light from which it came and reunites with it. But whereas in Neoplatonism, this evolution is moved by necessity, uh, in Christianity it occurs after the subject has made a conscious choice. Valery Shevchuk uh, emphasizes the dynamism in Skovoroda's garden by observing, quote, the poet places before us a triangle. We have the crooked path of the evil, which brings illusory satisfaction, sadness, sorrow, dissatisfaction, and then the narrow path of the good, which is difficult to attain, but uh, brings spiritual joy, peace, and satisfaction. And then we have the person who is at the crossroads and need to make a choice, end quote. 
Uh, the return to God is thus the result of, free, of the free choice of a subject who seeks to rise from the material world to a mystical union with God. The triadic movement often remains um, in the background because the subject perceives as pressing the dualistic opposition between attraction and rejection of evil. And this is what we see in Psalm 16. Um, here, oh lovely world, you are in an ocean, an abyss to me. You are darkness, clouds, whirlwind, sadness, sorrow. Here, starting from the oxymoric phrase, lovely world, these lines express on the one hand the fascination that earthly reality exerts on the subject, and on the other, the subject's awareness that this fascination is illusory. The up outcome of such attraction is expressed then in Psalm 14, in which we read, Flesh, world, oh, insatiable hell, everything is poison to you. You are poison to everyone. Through a broken metric rhythm and accumulation of exclamations and the juxtaposition of terms belonging to the religious spheres and the realm of food, uh, as highlighted in uh, Ukrainian by the imperfect rhyme between hell and poison, ad and yad, uh, Skovroda expresses the subject's experiences uh, which oscillate between the words temptations and the will to resist them. These characteristics are also explained by the nature of 18th century Kievan literature in which the rigid distinction between literary and non-literary language has, um, was observed in a, not in a strict manner. Because writers used to merge the church Slavonic, literary language, and colloquial speech. In fact, the entire song presents a sequence of expressive, expressive modalities, ranging from the religious to the colloquial tones, from um, dialogues to metaphors, uh, from questions to exclamations, which all serve to convey the subject's various moods. The fascination with worldly activities become a desire that oppresses the eye, as we see in Psalm 19. Ah, you damned melancholy, ah, bothersome sorrow. You know me since childhood, like a moth knows clothing, like rust knows steel. Here, torment and inner wounds are expressed in, by the especially bitter tone. Skovroda shows as the subject during another moment of crisis when earthly passions are so unbearable that they cause him to employ invectives, caesuras, apostrophes, exclamations, anaphores, and even, as you see here, unpleasant similes. The statistic devices give voice to the whirlwind of frustrations and failure experienced by the subject, and they express his struggle as he attempts to counter his motion and choose the narrow path of the good. The experience of the eye in Song 19 is also deepened through reference to childhood, which is usually associated with purity and serves as an antithesis to the simple qualities of the mundane world. This antithesis shows us how the existential and gnosiological human experience um, is always open-ended because wisdom is never definitive. And the very structure of the garden shows this because Kavaruda has not ordered the poems uh, according to logical evolution, but alternates moments of crisis and jubilation. This is why Karen Black notices in a collection, quote, a sense of tension, one's impression that the poem has an independent momentum and is on the point of spinning out of control. End of quote. The tension between attraction and rejection of earthly things increases the central role of the subject and develops the uh, idea of knowledge as a process. This constitutes the vibrant nature of the ethical, gnosiological, and ontological search that characterizes Skoboroda's philosophy. According to Skoboroda, the path towards salvation can start only when one understands the essence of evil, suffers from it, and then desires to reject it. And this is what we see in Psalm 28. Uh, the poem is based on the commonplace of the futility of earthly goods. Meanwhile, it expresses the sorrow of those who have fallen out of harmony with their true nature, thereby revealing the intensity of their inner existential condition. And um, here we see in these lines, conquer the 
entire earthly sphere be king to many peoples? What help is that to you if inside the soul cries? So here, the question on the one hand highlights the presence of the sub subject, but then also the fact that this is a rhetorical question highlights the moral message contained in this poem. Then uh, the first three stanzas of the poem end with the same sentence, but with a meaningful variation. So in stanza one, we have, when you're happy, you're poor and naked. Poor then becomes dead in stanza two and coward in stanza three. So this change symbolizes the evolution that the subject is going through. And uh, false goods cause spiritual death. And this outcome is the result exclusively of the coward who is unable to make a responsible choice. Knowledge must be paired with the choice to take responsibility for one's actions and the will mediates between knowledge and responsibility. By drawing on the teachings of the church fathers, Skovoroda affirms that evil does not exist since it is only lack of the good and the deficiency of will. Augustine sang the truth, there is and there was no hell. Your cursed freedom is hell, our freedom is the earth of our hell. Which these lines were also mentioned earlier. Um, so in these lines, Coverda states that we cause our own suffering by compromising our freedom through both weak will and growing accustomed to material goods. Thus, Coverda is urging his interlocutors to act against dismay. Look, if you will, inside yourself. You will find a friend inside yourself. There, you will find a second freedom. The meaning of these lines is clarified then in Psalm 23. Beloved friend, abandon idleness. This moment get done to business. Beginning with the Vagris Ponticus, continuing through patristic and medieval cultures, sloth has been considered the worst among capital sins and even as the origin of all sins. It consists of being inert and apathetic and makes people weak and subject to temptations. Hence, in order to defeat evil, one needs to act, which means carefully identifying passions and detaching oneself from them as they move one away from the truth. To act, one needs to purify the eyes, uh, susceptible to the fascination of material things, as Song Chu teaches us, wash the filth from the eyes, wash all the limbs of the body in order to ascend to the skies. And we see similar teachings throughout the collection. For instance, uh, in Psalm 1, we see wipe up the stone of the heart. In Psalm 21, we read sky, earth, and moon, all the stars goodbye. You all are an evil harbor for me. Only by bidding farewell to these elements can one start the platonic second navigation. In the garden, the... Um, Negative pole is often represented by the city of humans. I want to go to the rich city. Rich high cities rise on the sea of sorrows. Instead, the uh, positive pole is represented usually by individual solitude in untouched nature. I send my spirit to the mountains or sacred truth jewels. Detaching oneself from matter implies avoiding the crowd and the noise of worldly activities and focusing in order to look within oneself as the main cultural traditions in Skoboda's thought suggest. The key cultural reference here is uh, the Socratic maxim and know thyself, which is also the subtitle to one of Skoboda's dialogues, uh, Narcissus, discussion on the theme and know thyself. The other reference is also the biblical prescription, uh, take care and watch yourself closely, which we find in Paul, New Platonic thinkers and church fathers. Similarly, uh, Sikh thinkers maintain that the subject by knowing its inner self starts to realize its own essence. And so by combining all these different elements, Kovroda makes the connection between the gnosiological and ethical aspects of his process clearer and affirms that one needs to know oneself to identify, isolate, and eliminate evil. 
Through metaphors, similes, and acquisitions, Skvorda expresses how difficult it is to practice the principle know thyself. And this is what we see in Psalm 28. Drop the Copernican spheres, look into the heart's caves. So here, the reference to Copernicus uh, indicates earthly knowledge, which is then opposed to the heart's caves. So the depths of the heart, which are here expressed through a platonic metaphor um, that symbolize knowledge, the depth and unapproachability of knowledge. Um, nevertheless, only within oneself can the subject discover the divine spark that opens the path of ascension to God. As we see in the following lines, God is the best astronomer. He is the best housekeeper. Blessed by mother nature does not create anything foolishly. What you need the most, you will find within yourself. Here, the tension is then solved in the final chiasm in the song, uh, which is outlined here. Uh, what is necessary is not difficult. What is difficult is not necessary. What the speaker means here is that ascension to God appears as barely unattainable, but it is not, because the soul by its nature tends to God. Furthermore, human nature not only is made of earth and dust, but contains God within itself. Therefore, the difficult path of detaching oneself from earthly passions is to be faced with the knowledge that they are fleeting. Skovoroda thinks that a divine element is present in humankind, therefore stating that, quote, we will be happy with what God has given us. Um, once the subject has understood that the earthly world is the, not the only existing reality, he understands that nature is also good because God has created it. This conception extends back to Genesis, where it is written that after creation, quote, quote, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good, end quote. Also, Plutinus argues that nature, despite being the last in the scale of being, emanates from God and bears a spark of divine wisdom within itself. Conscious of this, the subject is now free to open up to the world in awe as a renewed individual and as a philosopher. Some of the poems in the garden express the purity of nature, the state in which the individual has freed himself from evil thoughts and is able to establish a joyful relationship with it. Scholar Laura Sattabustian defines this type of poem as a country nostalgia and identify the relationship between the subject and nature as simultaneously idyllic and melancholic. Uh, examples of country nostalgias are, for instance, songs 3, 12, and 13. And here I brought an example from song 3. And this type of poem expresses the joyful praise of Earth as it appears to the individual who has achieved self-awareness and purification. At this point, the Earth becomes the city of God and the Garden of Eden, and the sinner's song of despair and cry for help become an invitation to the purified subject to enjoy earthly happiness. This joy stems from Christian jubilation over divine creation and from the oration motto, Seize the Day. This is what we see also in song 24 and song 30, which is the last song in the collection, which kind of like sums up the main motifs in the entire song, in the entire collection, sorry. The song starts with the line that I wrote here, ah, let's renounce sorrows, ah, your life is short, little, which brings together both the speaker and his interlocutor. Um, the song ends then with a plea to detach oneself from earthly pleasures and enjoy life, tenderness. Do you want to live in sweetness? Don't be jealous anywhere. Be full with a small portion. Don't be afraid everywhere. Free yourself of the ashes of the coffin and of childish fears. Death is peace, not harm. Thus live the Athenian, thus live the Hebrew, Epicurus Christ. These closing lines, uh, the eye addresses a you who may actually coincide with the subject himself. Uh, when considering the opening rhetorical question and the opposition between positive and negative values, we see how even in this final song, the subject is not fully at peace with oneself. In this way, um, Psalm 30 serves as a counterpoint of Psalm 1, because whereas Psalm, Psalm 1 was dedicated entirely to fear of death, Song 30 proposes a reconciliation with human beings' mortality. We see also here the references to childhood that we have 
seen also in Psalm 19, and to idleness that we have seen in Psalm 12. The tension between the subject harmony and poor self-control is present in this psalm as well. And the writing emphasizes here both the intellectual and emotional tensions, while mimicking spoken language to convey the subject's uh, sentiments and fears. The speaker summarizes his classical and Christian cultural roots in the collection's final verse, Epicurus Christ. Bartolini indicates that Scoverda may have become acquainted with Epicurus thought from Erasmus Dialogue Epicurus, Clement of Alexandria's Traumata, and uh, Diogenes Laertius' Lives. Um, in Scoverda's philosophy, Epicurus represents ethical consistency and detachment from earthly matters. The juxtaposition uh, of the figures of Epicurus and Christ, leads, which leads Bartolini to coin the phrase uh, Christian Epicureanism to define Scoverda's worldview, represents the subject's evolution over the course of the collection, in which spiritual progress implies earthly pleasures. Bartolini pinpoints the earthly nature of the Scoverdian pleasures as expressed in Psalm 30, although, although she then highlights also the distinction between Scoverda and Epicurus. Whereas um, Epicurean materialism conceives of, of death as the termination of all sensations, Christianity identifies in death not the end, but the beginning of life in Christ. As a result, Epicureanism defines the goal of a happy life in the lack of any turmoil. So this, to this aesthetic form of pleasure, Skovoroda opposes a conception of happiness that is, quote, dynamic and little faithful to the original Epicurean doctrine, identifying the goal of Epicurean philosophy in the joy of the heart, end quote. Um, so what um, I uh, hope to have shown with this presentation is that um, this collection of poems highlighted a trait of Skovoroda's thought that find most appropriate expression in lyric poetry. And uh, poetry for Skovoroda is not merely a means of expression, but a tool for divine ascension. The speaker himself states this in Song 30, life is like a song. Um, standing for poetry, a song is um, like life. Um, not beautiful for its length, but beautiful for its goodness. And this is a quote from the uh, song and is able to grant humans comfort, happiness and sweetness of the heart. And quote, and end of my presentation. Thank you very, very much. Um, we have some time for discussion. If anybody would like to make a comment, ask a question, um, please use the uh, raised hand function in the um, um, reactions. Well, if nobody, if nobody is ready to start yet, um, let me ask a question. Um, I must admit that uh, this is my first exposure uh, to Scoverda. And um, I learned a tremendous amount from all four of the uh, presentations. But um, this is the thing that, that I, I'm most curious about. Um, the sort of, the sort of um, sources for his um, philosophical and theological thought, for the imagery in his um, um, in his poetry uh, were given as um, Neoplatonism, Augustine, Zoroaster, um, the Bible. Um, he's writing in the uh, mid late 17th century. What? Uh, excuse me, 18th century. Um, what is it that um, all of those all of those sources seem to me um, um, uh, rather older and could have been used much much earlier? What is it that uh, and this is a question for any of the speakers? What is it that's sort of distinctively 18th century about um, about his work? 
what is it that puts him at this at this particular historical moment? And I suspect the answer is going to be, you know, in part, what is it that it means within the Ukrainian intellectual and social and political and theological context to be an 18th century um, thinker, as opposed to say, you know, the, the Western European. Are there any takers for that question? I think that wants to reply first to your question. But, but I'm sorry, but who is going to? Oh, yeah, if, 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 if I may. Yes, please. Yeah. So, um, uh, as far as I uh, understood you, so um, you mean that uh, the sources of Skavarda are quite ancient one. Yeah. For, uh, as I have just said in my presentation that Skavarda belongs to Ukrainian Baroque period. Right. And Ukrainian Baroque period covers all these sources as well because it, it, it was a highly Christian period uh, for Ukrainian culture and um, if I rightly remember if I don't uh, I think someone may um, correct me uh, that um, Dmitry Chizhevsky uh, one of the scholars who went deeply into Skurada Calls Korda the last flower of um, Ukrainian uh, old Ukrainian culture of old Ukrainian Baroque. So uh, that is uh, all as well with Korda. But uh, here's uh, a bit uh, um, a bit different from uh, what we used to in uh, in the modern period for for Western Europe. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I tell you, if you want to add something, your 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 microphone is not on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Good. I'd like to venture an answer. This is something that has bothered me many times. I study Spanish literature of the 17th and 18th century, and there is a radical difference between the thematic content of. Uh, even Italian uh, literature of the period, there's a radical difference between what interests the Ukrainian writers produced at the Kiev Mohila uh, Collegium and uh, their Western counterparts, my fellow Latin Americans. Uh, we are dealing here with a cultural divide that is up to a certain extent, <clears throat> the problem with the humanistic school curriculum. When that curriculum was accepted at the end of the 16th century, it was a superb way of catching up with the West and um, uh, making Ukrainian Orthodoxy competitive with their Polish Catholic neighbors. And it worked well at the beginning. However, the humanistic school in Poland and in Western Europe gradually began, began transforming itself. So the ardent defenders of Latin, um, as, as the medium of communication, the, uh, you have the Protestants in Germany, the Jesuits in, in Western Europe, they begin writing in the vernacular. Mm -hmm. The people at the Cave Mohila Collegium are not interested in writing in the vernacular for the simple reason that their primary goal is to uh, 
have Latin debates on theological questions. <clears throat> and the um, people who created the secular literature that we find in Western Europe were not necessarily the monks, but they were businessmen, courtiers, etc. So you have a parallel educational system in the West where even the humanists who are defending Latin, they have to know the languages, the, the uh, uh, the languages of the of the court, and they have to learn the language of each king. And this happens also in Poland. So you have Polish thinkers and poets writing in Polish at least a century, a century and a half before all this happens. There is no competing educational system. Uh, that satisfies the needs of the secular world. This is not the problem of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. I have argued in its defense, it is the problem of the secular nobility, the Cossacks, who were captives to the uh, religious thinking of their church. So instead of introducing um, court uh, writings in their own language. It took them a long time to do that and they begin doing that by the middle of the 18th century. Uh, I'll give you an example, Ivan Mazapa, fantastic uh, nobleman, a fantastic political leader, a very ardent, a uh, supporter of the church, he is not interested in these secular issues. He will write folk songs, not folk songs, he will write love poems in Ukrainian, but he does not publish them. These things don't, don't uh, circulate. You do have um, uh, Ukrainian uh, mathematicians studying in the West uh, and other uh, people involved in other professions, but for some reason they do not create or translate the, the literature that can in, uh, inform the creation of a secular oriented culture. This, this problem turns um, around at approximately the same time that uh, Skovoroda's first uh, collection of, of, um, of prose, his Narcissus is published. And it is Ivan Kotlerevsky, an army man um, who served in the, in the uh, Russian army, he starts writing plays and poetry that is of a completely different nature. And he's definitely informed by contemporary German, uh, most probably German writings. Mm -hmm. So almost at the same time that Skovoroda is writing, a new culture is being created. The only in a few years, that is after Skovoroda's death in 1790, you have also the influence of Romanticism coming in and the production of uh, poetry and prose narratives in the native language, which is highly influenced by German thought. As a matter of fact, at Kharkiv University, uh, you have German professors creating a folklore tradition based on the, on the material that they, they collected among the peoples. Uh, the problem is, is that the church as it was, was not interested in what was going on among the people. Um, 
as good as they were, as successful as they were in defending their culture up to a certain point, they were ignoring the reality around them. And it took a completely different um, worldview to introduce what you would like to, to see. You have people reading French, by the way, at the end of the 18th century, people being acquainted with uh, Voltaire, but it takes a little bit of time to introduce that into the production of texts that reflect the uh, uh, that world. The final point that I would like to make is that the Cave Mohila Academy uh, experiences apex uh, at the at the beginning of Skovoroda's career as a student, and it was gradually deteriorating. By the end of the 18th century, it becomes a provincial uh, theological seminary because there are strong restrictions coming in from the empire uh, against the use of the folk language. So there are many factors. I don't think that I have uh, um, communicated everything in a cohesive uh, fashion, but these are the, the we're witnessing in Skovoroda the last example of a Baroque culture, a beautiful Baroque poet who is not interested in the folk songs of the people around him in the Kharkiv area. And that's his, he's a product of the humanistic school. Erasmus is a good example, but he was in a different period. Erasmus uh, refused to learn the native, uh, the, 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 the language spoken around him in Paris. When a Parisian came up to him and said something in French, he answered in Latin, absurdum locut, as you're speaking to a deaf man. And these are the, um, the contradictions of a culture that developed in the hands of the church and did not develop because the secular nobility did not create a competing educational model. Well, that's, that's, that's extremely illuminating for what, um, uh, Maria, you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I would like to briefly add something to what Natalia has like so clearly and brilliantly um, explained. Um, yeah, Skoroda is product of his own environment, of his own school curriculum. And so we have what we may call a paradox of an intellectual writing at the end of the 18th century and whose um, intellectual orientation and intellectual interests are more similar to those of um, Anatonizes Kirchner writing in the 17th century and being interested in all this hermetic, esoteric, esoteric things. And uh, as Natalia has already pointed out, this is a period when Ukrainian culture is going underground in a certain way because of this restrictions on the use uh, of Ukrainian uh, because of um, the progressive, um, uh, the, the Atmanate is progressive losing its political, its political autonomy uh, with respect to the Russian empire. And um, in a way, um, um, Skovoroda's uh, intellectual path uh, reflects uh, this uh, need uh, to go to go underground, his own like, um, his whole career um, reflect, um, reflects that. <clears throat> And um, there is also like a personal element that we have to consider uh, is all the personal intellectual interests uh, is um, a deeply intellectual, but also deeply uh, non, uh, not uh, contemporary uh, author. I think that uh, this is part of his own like uh, idiosyncrasies and peculiarities. Um, as uh, as a writer, like um, to be more interested uh, in this um, uh, melt uh, of uh, um, ancient theologians, uh, uh, Renaissance writers, Renaissance and humanistic writers, uh, and so on. 
I think we have to consider also this uh, personal orientation. Um, again, that's very illuminating. I was very impressed um, when Erica went through um, the poetry and explained you know, how it is that it was put together, the kinds of imageries that he used, the kind of techniques he used to, to, um, to write his poetry, which struck me as extremely interesting, extremely sophisticated. Um, the last of the Baroque means, I, if I understand correct, but what, what, what Victor was saying, that it was, you know, already by that time, kind of an archaic, um, kind of an archaic style. Um, the question, but my question again is, or my question now is, who was he addressing? Who was his audience? Yeah. Um, can I, may, may I um, say, add something too? Of course. Yeah, um, I wanted to say that uh, it seems to me that um, there are also like different cultural traditions also undergo different um, periodizations and different evolutions. So that would also, keeping this in mind, would also explain uh, the temporal differences, uh, distinctions between, uh, you know, for instance, the mentioned Spanish or Italian and Ukrainian uh, cultures. Um, and also uh, a very, to me, interesting aspect of Ukrainian culture is also the um, fact that poetry is also a tool for philosophical discourse. Uh, which we see uh, very well in Skavrda's poetry, but also um, I think in other poetry as well. So it's uh, I think again it it also it it speaks to to the same type of question because um, the reason or the idea of literature as belles lettres, as we may see in other um, cultural traditions, comes at a different time, and so. Poetry or the garden here in this specific case is not just uh, a, you know, a collection of poems for leisure, uh, but it, it is supposed, um, it, it was composed initially for the students of uh, the Collegium of Pireslav where um, Skovroda was teaching at the time, but it's also, uh, as I uh, hope to have made clear, but it, it, it also serves other goals um, and as a representation of, on the one hand, the unity of uh, human existence uh, in uh, Skavroda's philosophy, uh, the unity also of human knowledge, uh, keeping together this um, very apparently heterogeneous um, trends of, of thought. Um, and it's also, uh, it seems to me, it's also a model for people who uh, want to read this poetry and have an example of what is considered ethical behavior, probably, it seems to me. Um, I may answer the yes, question please. about who is he writing for? most of the things, most of the poetry that he wrote was as part, as part of his teaching assignments uh, in the Kharkiv Collegium. Uh, a typical post-Renaissance situation where writers write poetry for children, okay? They don't treat poetry very seriously. The moment that he gets out, and I'm not saying that his poetry is not serious. It is very beautiful and very serious. But the moment that he gets out, he stops writing poetry for the most part and moves into prose, into these philosophical discussions. Who are the recipients of his, um, uh, of his uh, dialogues? And they are, they are participants in the colloquies. Uh, there are landowners, there are lawyers, there are businessmen. Uh, one of them appears to be of Jewish background. Uh, there is a young student or at least someone with the name Farah, 
which suggests that he is at the lower end of the trivium and uh, and he has a difficult time understanding the quadrivial arguments made by the theologians at the higher level. So basically we're dealing here, oh, there is another teacher and his former student with whom he was very much in love. There is a, uh, it's a small circle of friends. He does not have an audience uh, that is much wider than that. Although at the end of his life, about four months before he died, he prepared a list of artic of, of his collection asking his student, not he didn't quite ask, but we suspect that he wanted them to be published. So this brings me to the second point. Um, the publication of poetry and the publication of prose that was not of a religious nature uh, was not supported by the church. We have a whole bunch of churchmen publishing their fantastic panegyrics, which are really very poor poetry, but not supporting the young students and the young uh, poets who are really very good poets. There is at the end of the 17th century, there's a fantastic poet. His name is Johan Velichkowski. He writes Carmina Burana. It's all religious, but it is brilliant. And he wants to communicate the knowledge of his native language through these. And the bishop simply ignores his request because he's too busy praising the empress. So this brings me to the last point. The kind of uh, social structure that you would need to support the kind of literature that we are interested in uh, would require a court. There is no court. After 1709, the Ukrainian state is uh, destroyed with the Poltava battle. And then Catherine, uh, Manage, manages to destroy uh, the Cossack independence, the, 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 the hegemonate. And the only business that Ukrainians have who are noble, who can do things, is to serve the Tsars and to serve the Tsarinas. That is what is permissible to them. So you can imagine my frustration when I study a Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, a nun, who wrote beautiful mystical poetry, but also very nice erotic love poetry. And I compare Skovoroda's um, uh, writing technique with hers. They share so many things in common, but she is writing in her native language and she is being supported by the Viceroy of Mexico. And they are publishing her books in Madrid. Incredible. I think I think we've run out of time. Okay. Oh, Erica, do you have one? I want to just, but if uh, I want to just ask a question, but if we are out of time, it's fine. Oh, why not ask a question and we'll end with a question, whether oh. we can answer it or not. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I was, I have this question about the uh, second presentation about uh, Prisca Theologia. Um, my question is um, whether um, you consider, so it's towards Maria Grazia Bartolini, whether you consider uh, this apparent misquotations as uh, mistakes. Um, I'm asking because this was the term that you used during your presentation, or if there could be something, so to say something else going on in the sense that both examples that you brought um, have some similarities in the sense that apparently they seem to be misquotations, but then if we consider the figures that are quoted, there are some, um, semantic proximities between the, the thought, the, the, the ideas, you know, the yeah. authors and their ideas. So- can you, can you give a quick answer to the yeah, question? Yeah, I, I will be very quick in my answer. Uh, I don't have a, de a definite answer to that. 
Uh, there could be misquotations because given the conditions in which he was like living and study and writing, he, he didn't always have all the books with him. And so he would quote from memory. And we see a lot of this um, paraphrases and everything with the Bible, for instance, uh, or uh, there could be like some more sophisticated mechanism at play there. And I think that there is so much like to delve and discover uh, in the way Skomorodal was constructing his text. This is something mm -hmm. that's not been explored enough. Um, so uh, it could be both and yeah. uh, it's worth uh, like uh, exploring more. Yeah. Thank you. I think we're going to have to end here. I'd like to thank all of the participants for a um, very interesting um, uh, seminar. Um, next week will be the last seminar in the fall series, um, and it will be about Leibniz's philosophical theology. And I hope to see many of you, uh, many of you there next week. But thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.